Awesome. So I'll start over. Um, again, my name is Vicki Ampia. I'm the director for TRIO programs at Bowling Green State University. Um, I have, we have four programs at Bowling Green. McNair is one of them. I also direct the SSS program and the Educational Talent Search program. And then we also have an Upward Bound program. So I was just um, making a statement that we, I had made an offer to a person who had just completed her PhD for our McNair um, um, position and she declined. She accepted another position at another institution um, and her reasoning to me was that she was afraid of grant dollars given what's happening in this current state of COVID-19 um, and I happen to know that our grants are protected and actually the university is has a hiring freeze and they're cutting and I was just kind of like Wow, I wonder who she's seeking for advice, <laughs> but um, but also realizing that McNair is always the the program that is always questioned too when it comes time for people to start challenging um, if they're going to be making cuts in trio. So um, anyway, with that said, um, I am the uh, first facilitator for the first uh, portion of um, this um, discussion. And so the first topic um, for, of discussion is centered around um, policies and procedures manuals um, post COVID-19. Um, I will say that we, I have not necessarily looked at our policies and procedures manual, although it is being challenged because like, what do we do with students as we think about um, some students plan to stay at the university in, in Bowling Green and apartments. So now that some students have gone home, some of them were gonna live on campus and they would have had coverage, right? For their um, living on campus, their housing, their room and board. Uh, and then we did cover um, lease agreements for the period that the students were in the research institute, the summer research institute. Now, you know, students are asking like, you know, are you, we still covering the lease for those students because they can't, concentrate at home or they had already signed leases and so what does that mean um, and then for the students who are at home they're asking questions well do they get housing allowances because they're back at home for meals and things like that so that is a direct challenge I think to a policy and procedure manual that I can see so I'm going to open it up for you guys like wh where are you guys seeing challenges or having concerns or if you've had to make changes to your policies and procedures manual So I can, uh, one of the things that we're doing, I'm at um, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, and we don't um, base our uh, room and board on a, a lease agreement. Uh, this is probably the first time that I've, I've heard so many people talking about it, them paying for a specific thing. We give them an allowance, and right now we give them 300, well, we give them a total of $700 for room and board and then they apply it as, as they need it. And so uh, I'm not sure if people have flex, more flexibility than they assume because there, there's really nothing that's um, telling us how we need to um, give out room and board allowances. So maybe there's some flexibility within there. I guess uh, my question would be then, I'm hearing um, that comment um, because I know in the past we've always either, we've covered the lease for the summer session for that period of time, or we've covered the room and board while students were still living on campus. What are other people doing in terms of, uh, of that? Like how are you handling your students room and board for the summer? Hi, so I'm Janice Johnson from um, St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. <clears throat> and I mean, we've been going around, we made a kind of, uh, not a request exactly, but we told our grants office that we were planning to pay for students who were living at home 
uh, this summer because they are required to contribute to rent or mortgages or, you know, whatever. But they actually said that they came back and said it would not be auditable because, but we always have had room and board in our uh, restricted funds for our grant and it's always been approved. But this, when the students have lived on campus, that was one thing as far as our college's response has been. But um, we're definitely going to move forward. I, we just are in the process of creating um, a form that talks about like uh, just the reason that we need to pay, you know, that students are helping with meals and utilities and, you know, other expenses that just to be able to live at home. And so a lot of times even um, some of our, well, a lot of our parents have lost their jobs, so there's no income even coming in. And a lot of our, or some of our students have taken on like essential jobs working at a grocery store or something to help pay the, you know, for the family's foods and, and needs. So we are proposing, or I don't know if I'm proposing it exactly. I'm still looking for some kind of guidance, like from COE or something where I could fall back on that to say, actually, this is in place that this is, it's an approved expense or an approved way to use the room and board this summer under these extenuating circumstances, which I don't think we've gotten yet, but I'm hopeful that something will come out. Um, but otherwise, we just created a form and we're going to have students sign it and just say that this is what I'm contributing to my mortgage or my rent or whatever. Um, and we're going to pay them the same amount as they would have gotten if they lived on campus, which is at St. Olaf, it's $700. And yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer right now, but it's certainly something we're tr trying to figure out. I'm interested in what other people are doing too. Thanks. So uh, this is Dante McFadden uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Marquette. I'm the Senior Associate uh, Director for Undergraduate Research and High Impact Practices, and I'm the Director of the McNair Program there. And one of the things I'm in the process of working on right now is uh, trying to get um, housing and meal allowances for each of the students. So uh, the university has closed all of the residence halls for the summer. And I, um, some of you were uh, took part in policy seminar when it went virtual. Um, a little over a month ago. And one of the things that kept being reemphasized is that we as directors, uh, as PIs, uh, we had the flexibility to shift um, dollars from um, one line item to another. And obviously with uh, travel, um, you know, since that's uh, pretty non-existent at this point, you know, that's one line item we can move towards housing and meal allowances. And in addition to that, um, I think um, Janice, to directly respond to your question, I think it might be worth um, either having your program officer or, you know, even seeing someone like Carmen Gordon, um, you know, can draft um, a letter or even an email at least uh, just to present, um, you know, to the grants office or, you know, the, you know, what, you know, whatever office on your campus is managing the money, um, just to let them know that um, it's officially authorized by the U.S. Department of Education for you to do so. And, um, you know, and it's authorized because of the circumstances the students are in. Um, I would just chime in this, Risa Lopez. I'm at Knox College in Illinois. Um, in, in last year's policy seminar when we had, well, it was prior with the Department of Education, relations with the Department of Ed. Um, in the McNair session, Suzanne Ulmer was there and Rashawn. Um, but when Suzanne got there, she specifically, I know I said this the other day with the MAP um, session, she specifically said, not that you would find in the, in the regulations that it was allowable, but more so that it was not specifically stated as unallowable. And she encouraged us to talk about housing for off-campus students um, as, something that your program could do. It was the year that we got an increase and people were talking about how to spend their money. Um, and she strongly encouraged that as, a, as an option. Um, and that was from a program officer. Now get her to put that in writing is another story. So, um, and then people on Tuesday also had mentioned um, the uniform guidance has subsistence language, that that was what they were citing, that that was allowable. Subsistence allowance was allowable, um, but Suzanne Ulmer's point was that it's not in there as, a, as listed as allowable, but just that it's not 
unallowable. I guess that that um, really kind of causes me to question when we think about um, for the grants office, like I know we usually the students who are on campus, that's a no brainer. They'll transfer funds just from the um, residential folks over to the grant, right? But when we think about leases, the students then turn in a copy of the lease. What about, so as we think through that, I know I can, I can already hear our grants office um, persons um, saying things like, well, what do you have for us to attach to the payment? So as we think about students who are at home, how might we think about like support, documentation support for those students who are, who would have you know, otherwise lived on campus who are now at home. They would not have a copy of a lease. Is that something that perhaps maybe, and I'm thinking, I was trying to think outside the box here, perhaps maybe their parents or someone should give them, write them up a lease. This is what it's gonna cost for you to live at home for documentation because, you know, I heard somebody talked about things being auditable. How, how are you gonna, you know, what are you gonna attach to that payment? And the reality is thinking about our scholars, um, their job in the summer is to do their research, to, to participate in the Summer Research Institute. So if they're trying to go get jobs to become central workers or they're doing other things, the likelihood of them, whatever modification we give to our SRI, right, they, they may not be engaging if they have to go out and get a job. So I can, I can almost hear the justification for why we're trying to provide, um, you know, this, this room and board for them, but how would we document that? Um, again, as a person who's been doing this allowance since we started in 2002 or three, we, we actually, there in the regulations, it says during the summer, you, that's the only time it's allowable to provide um, that allowance. And so that's usually what we have attached um, for to initially to clear it up with our grants office. But I, I, it, I don't know that you can actually get them to provide that kind of documentation. Um, but it, I do think the argument about them not seeking additional um, employment is critical because we do consider this work. Um, and so maybe that's the space to, to draft some kind of memo. I guess, you know, when I think about that, it, my concern would be because of like, for me, the history for our institution is that, you know, the students who lived off campus, it depends on where they lived. So that each person's lease may look differently. So then like with you, you have a consistent history that they, they would look at. So it wouldn't be a question, but for some, for other folks who may be covering like lease terms, where do you draw the line for that dollar amount? So for, for, for so perhaps for maybe we can look at housing for students who would have otherwise lived on campus, would that be the base? What are, you, what are other people's thoughts? How are you guys, how are you thinking through um, handling housing for students or room and board for, for students and, and payments? Vicki, we have always, um, this is Liz from Kent State University in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, Hi, Liz. We have always, hey, we have always included um, a $1,000 housing allowance for on cam off campus students in our grants. Mm. Um, so um, because all of our students are off campus, they're all going to get that $1,000 housing allowance. Um, and we just, um, we just, uh, for documentation, we just attach the page from the grant proposal, the approved grant proposal that says that's what we're going to do. And our grants accounting office has always accepted that, that with no question. Okay. So some of us may have work to do while others kind of, it's kind of already, 
is already clear and it's, there's no, no gray area. So it sounds like that's kind of the case that's happening here. It just depends on how your grant was written, what your past history was in terms of that. Um, and maybe, you know, thinking about this whole um, conversation about policies and procedures manual post COVID, um, maybe providing some kind of update to that. And maybe even for that matter, reaching out to the program officer if necessary to get support. Um, any other um, topics that have come up for you guys in terms of your policies and procedures? I just know um, in the case of Marquette, um, you know, we're, we have um, a department that houses all of the TRIO programs. And so our policies and procedures for, Mc, for McNair um, you know, obviously a great deal of the language would come from the grant, but mm -hmm. it would also be a portion of the department-wide policies and procedures that we would have. All right. I know that um, as we think about some of our summer programs, um, our grants accounting, we were talking about like paying for um, access through internet and for staff for students and um, our grants office pushed back about staff coverage for internet, um, but said that perhaps we could get hotspots, but how would we um, ensure that the students are using that for like what they're doing with our program. Um, we just happen to have a very special relationship with our grants office at Bowling Green. Um, and sometimes it can be very, very frustrating dealing with them. So um, I just kind of politely ask the question, um, is this a university policy? Because we have, you know, our university policy in terms of like what things are covered and then what regulation says. And so um, I have not heard back, like, is, are you guys saying that no, you cannot cover internet or, um, you know, like, what does that look like? Are you saying that from a perspective of legislation or regulations, or are you saying that from the university's policy? Um, and, and that, that becomes, um, I think, a, 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 a question for some folks, it could, it could be um, in terms of how you're covering, even if you're going to cover, like if you're doing room and board, would that include the internet usage? I have one of our scholars at our campus who she's at home, but the parent, they don't, they can't afford internet. And although during this semester, the university has an emergency fund, um, what about summer? So like those are some of the challenges that we're facing. And so it's like, okay, now I got to go back to the drawing board and think through that and like how that might work. So um, yeah, there's also that university versus regulation policy that right. you have to consider. And then on top of that, chances are you may have students who, you know, may study popular culture or, you know, may study the social sciences in which, you know, they may study certain type of phenomena that might render as inappropriate by the grants office. And it's not really the grants office that should determine the t uh, basis of the research, it's the faculty mentor and the McNair scholar that should determine the basis of the research. So I guess, you know, for what it's worth, I would recommend reaching out to, um, you know, who, um, you know, whatever, you know, the, what unit you're in, uh, you know, just to, um, you know, identify, you know, these are some reasons for why, you know, the students who are participating in this program this summer would be utilizing e internet for their research. Right. Would it, would it be possible, like, in the, where you, your students are developing their research proposals and, and what they're doing, like, they often are writing a budget to accompany those things anyway, like supplies that they may need, you know, they can just be listing in their proposals that they need internet and then checking like, yes, that's available to me or not. Because my understanding from this year's policy where the Department of Ed was talking and, and, and a lot of COE's recommendation as well, just saying, if you're categorizing these as research expenses, that it's much easier for it to make sense. If it's, this is what's necessary for our seminar to occur, these are the materials for our seminar, and this is what's included. Um, but to just have it be 
you know, I'm just trying to think of how, like forms and things, pr procedures that we already have, but that would just add in that layer to really substantiate for if they're using um, the Turk thing that I can't think of right now, um, like mm -hmm. where they're accessing data. Yeah, like, so all those kinds of things, they're gonna do interviewing, whatever they're gonna maybe be doing for these lit reviews that they would need to have certain tools and things that are necessary to accomplish it. We would buy them a camera to do something. Why wouldn't right. we then, you know, provide that access um, but just to try to layer it into kind of our existing policies or practices, I would think that would help. Awesome. I'm going to, um, anybody else have anything else they want to talk about in terms of policies and procedures? I want to switch gears here if I can to um, talking about um, actual virtual programs and activities and student engagement. So, um, We've had to, um, we do our research methods class um, in the spring with our students at Bowling Green. And um, we, part of our class was switched to asynchronous. So um, where students were allowed, we would, you know, kind of do, have lectures and they would watch those and they would do any kind of assignments and they would have to, we switch some things to be, uh, maybe assignments were due on Sunday by midnight as opposed to by the next class time right um, and then we also had some GRE prep with words um, and we um, decided to at a certain point to just postpone that because part of in the summer part of what our students do is they do some prep work for the GRE using Magoosh so we were using Kahoot when we were in person and we tried that <laughs> online and it just was a disaster because everybody's internet, there was lag time and it just didn't work. Um, and so um, we really spent that second class time in discussions about where students were at with their research, what challenges they were facing. So it was kind of like we talked about um, what challenges students were facing. We had, at some cases, faculty mentors who were kind of like almost backing out on students because this was just going to be too much and they didn't see how summer was going to go. So we used that time to, to kind of have students to engage with each other and to hear some of the challenges that everybody was facing. Some students were you know, back at home and moving from home to home because this didn't work when I went back. Just kind of the whole, it was across the gamut. So we used our second class kind of as a support group um, slash troubleshooting opportunity so that I was able to like maybe send emails to faculty mentors who were um, having questions about whether or not they could still support the student given COVID, right, and, and going virtual. Um, and then also for students who maybe were having challenges and they were thinking about maybe they should come back to the summer. They weren't originally planning to because they were going to live on campus. Now they're thinking about getting a lease because this home situation is just, is not going to be helpful. So what are you guys doing and what are your thoughts around engaging students for, 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 for your summer research institute, given what you've seen just throughout the rest of the spring semester? So something that I'm thinking about right now is um, just trying to organize some type of um, orientation process um, as we shift to the summer. Because um, if it were just an in-person orientation, I would just do like a two-day orientation before the eight-week component um, officially started. And I'm um, evaluating that right now. Um, so, I mean, that part of the orientation will simply be, you know, just students um, getting to know the staff. Um, I actually just hired a new program coordinator. So this will be um, obviously a really good opportunity uh, for her to get to know the students and for the students to know her, but also just to know who the uh, summer instructors will be, who the graduate students will, um, that will be working with them uh, this summer. But um, in addition to that, um, you know, just um, using that as an opportunity for students just to talk about, you know, in this particular situation, since we're going to be operating online, you know, what are some things that, you um, they feel most confident about um, with the research and their overall participation and what are some things that worry them? Um, you know, so just, um, I guess um, I would suggest maybe one or two sessions where you're just, um, you know, having some icebreaker questions and things like that. 
And I also encourage students, um, and I think they've done this already, um, you know, just to start a group chat, um, you know, just so that we can um, communicate with each other. Um, because I think it's all, uh, really important for us as staff to check in, but, you know, sometimes they need, um, you know, that space to themselves to work things out, you know, where the quote unquote parents aren't looking over their shoulder. I agree. Um, we, our students do have a group chat. And so they, they ask their questions and they seek each other's assistance. And then somebody will come out. Well, in the group chat, we were talking about this. Can you give us more information about, and it's almost like you feel bad because usually the cohort, that's when they bond is in the summer research Institute. Right. Like, you know, how do you create that? Because like we had opportunities during our summer research Institute for everybody to go to lunch together. Now they won't have that. So you know, what are you, what are some thoughts from other folks who haven't kind of spoke up or said anything about how you're thinking about um, and having student engagement during your, um, your summer program? You, you know, you were talking about mainly doing the summer. Most of our students at the University of Missouri, we don't do, most students do it during the summer. Um, and so trying to create that community is always tough. Um, one of the big things we've been able to do, and I hate, I'm saying this as an example, but then got to take it all a step backwards, is when they go to a conference together, that, that travel time, that everything else, they're able to get it. And now with all of that up in the air, who knows what you can do, um, but sometimes finding something like that can be the biggest thing, but who knows with how long social distancing will remain um, or anything else. But I think that's one of the biggest ones. Um, Beyond that, having a casual, you know, I, I think of what I'm, what we're doing. Uh, my wife is literally having a, a, a happy hour with her friends via Zoom here in a few hours. Uh, that would be one of the biggest things I would say to do. But that sounds like you're condoning alcohol drinking. <laughs> you can have a happy hour without alcohol. <laughs> I mean, that's most of y'all have drank with, so let's hey. <laughs> Give it a different name and don't do alcohol. <laughs> Give it like a brown bag luncheon or yeah. Uh, yeah. a TV tray dinner. I would, I would say we, we, Carrie and I, as Vito, who's on here, and I have worked together 13 years, and we love our summer thing, and we do Fridays 9.30 to 12.30, and all of a sudden we're putting on the brakes like, who can stand that? They're not <laughs> three hours of, you know, in person. we have the break and we have some fun or some food or some, you know, so I, I don't know how we try to like, um, well, not happy hour, but drop in uh, for the sem when we would normally have the seminar time. And, and it was, you know, slightly awkward, but not a hundred percent awkward. It's just so hard right now to navigate what, they will, I like um, the ideas of, of these questions, like the idea of having something open ended, like what are you comfortable with? Like, um, I guess Dante said, you know, what are you confident about? Vicki, some of what you were saying. You know, I mean, we think, well, maybe they'll not be that comfortable with a three hour session on Friday anymore. And then how do we, you know, how do we, that it's hard. I'm I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna a couple of things. This is Sierra at UW River Falls. Um, another thing you guys can think about for is to do games right at the beginning of your pop-in session, um, and then maybe you begin to keep a point system, right? And so we're gonna get to see these guys again. Okay, this isn't like this is how we're gonna have to be forever or, or until they graduate. If it is, I think we're all gonna pull our hair out. But uh, maybe you do something like that, like, hey, if you pop in and you play this little game and you get some points, then when we see each other in the fall, you know, you'll get um, a little prize or a little something, right? I mean, I'm pretty bad to go out and spend my own money more than I should. But, you know, just something to keep them engaged, to keep them excited, you know, and um, students really don't care so much. Or maybe it's just like, hey, look at me. I've won some. I've got the highest points, right? And so you kind of have this couple of, you know, maybe do that every other week during those pop in sessions so that they're making that connection. They're having fun. They're enjoying those times together. So if you don't want to do a happy hour or something like that, something a little bit fun, but keeps them going, keeps them going from time to time. 
making that connection. Because I don't know about y'all, but my kids always play games in the vans when they're driving from one site visit to the next, <laughs> you know? And that's more what I'm thinking about, like, you know, maybe it's a trivia or something. There's a lot of those team building five, 10 minute games that could be kind of fun to do virtually. But you could yeah. still do virtually. Go, going right off that, a couple of my buddies and I we were talking about doing this. There's a Steam game, which Steam's like a gaming way to system on your computer you can download. There's a tabletop simulator that you can do that where you can play all sorts of different board games with each other and it kind of still has the interaction to it. I haven't looked too much into that, but it's a thought. That's something pretty awesome. Something that I've done um, that's actually pretty similar along this line and it's been pretty successful. I piloted it last summer. I still do it now that we're virtual and I plan on doing it this summer for the new cohort is I actually play Dungeons and Dragons with my students. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a role-playing game, um, which you typically play week after week. Um, and the thing I love about it is, um, well, there's a couple of things, but the biggest benefits I've seen are that, like you all said, it gives the scholars something to look forward to and takes away some of those other pressures because it's so free form. Um, they're constantly saying how therapeutic it is this term, especially since they can't see each other and just getting together for a time to laugh and have a good time is great. Um, but it also builds that team building right at the get-go. Playing Dungeons and Dragons really forces a cooperative game. And so they have to work together to be able to accomplish the tasks you set for them. Um, so if you've never played, there's lots of free resources online, but I would definitely recommend it as an icebreaker. Um, there, with all the free stuff that's happening right now, it makes the barrier of entry, if you've never played before, really low. Um, so it's really easy to get started, but just a suggestion. Awesome. Um, so as I think about, um, I, somebody had mentioned like doing a three hour, I think it was Margaret, um, having a three hour session, like we would have two days during the week where we met for like four hours and we work, worked through various different, maybe had someone from the career center come over to talk about curriculum vitas or we taught, we had, you know, opportunities for students to learn about graduate school applications and doing things like that. Um, and so we, in thinking about that, like, you know, we know we're not, that's not going to work. So we're, we've modified or we've talked, had discussions about modifying how much time and maybe having multiple days as opposed to just two days and having less time spent in meeting times like, like this um, with students. And then we've also um, created a canvas shell at our institution. So I guess my question to next would be like, what, what are you guys using in terms of, um, creating your spaces online or virtual for you to be able to accomplish your program? I've been using uh, Microsoft Teams um, through Outlook. Um, I, I'm uh, wrapping up our undergraduate research seminar for our new cohort that I'll be taking into the summer. And that's worked pretty well for us. Uh, last night, um, we had the first half of the cohort give um, PowerPoint presentations of the resources. So, um, that's pretty much how we'll do throughout the summer with our seminars and check ins as well. So, we have Canvas um, through our university, and so we're able to put and use everything through Canvas, which is something I, and I know that. Um, even though you're a, you may not be an academic program per se, right? Um, because you are a program on campus, you should be able to have access to Blackboard and all of those, so you can kind of, kind of keep that form like the students have become very accustomed to. And so, that's the only reason why we've tried to stick with the same thing that they're already doing their classes with, so that I'm not adding another layer, or another stress to them that they, I got to learn something new, I got to learn something different again, you know. And so, kind of keeping that trying to be as consistent as, as possible. So I don't know about you, but this is like the third or fourth different type of video conferencing that I've had to download and learn to use. Um, and so trying to keep that. And then we have, of course, just, you know, the expectations of what they are. It's, it's pretty much will be lined out pretty nicely for them so that they're kind of used to that. Um, we are, we do the math and language tutoring, and we're going to use utilize that right through Canvas. So those um, faculty members that are going to do our math and language tutoring 
they'll be able to put their information and be able to take that information back there. And so, and then they'll be able to do asynchronous or synchronous recordings and then throw it right back up there for those that, for whatever reason, couldn't make it. Um, our plan for our uh, math and language tutoring is to do synchronous um, because we are paying the student. We feel like we can kind of command their time a little bit. I, I don't think we'll do three hour sessions, but you know, a little bit more. But what we want is this, this the teachers want that instant feedback, right? They kind of see how they're doing. And, um, but then like I said, we'll record for those that might have had internet problems during it, and then they can go back and grab it. Anybody else using anything different from Microsoft Teams or Canvas? At Kent State, we're using um, Blackboard uh, Collaborate, which is video conferencing that's inside of Blackboard. That's our campus LMS. So um, uh, similar to what other folks have said, we, we wanted to use something that students were familiar with. Um, and our university is really pushing um, all of our communication with students to be through um, Blackboard and to save Teams, which we also have for staff communication. Awesome. Last question I have, and then I'm going to turn it over to, the, uh, to, to Dante, um, is really centered around, um, as you think about um, conferences for your students, um, which is something that all of the scholars, I think, look forward to at the end of summer. And now that that is um, a lot, some in some cases, it's moved to be virtual. Um, Liz, I know that at Kent State, you guys were supposed to have a conference this year. Can you speak to what's happening with that? But like, what are you guys thinking in terms of that? Are, have, are you delaying to fall or are you guys going to have your students to do some kind of virtual conference in summer and then maybe planning for fall trip? Um, what are your thoughts? So our um, conference was canceled um, because we're not sure exactly what's happening as far as uh, being allowed to have events on our campus this summer. Um, but um, UCLA has announced that their McNair conference is going to be mm -hmm. online, virtual, so we're considering that. So I'm just waiting to get more information about what's happening with that um, conference. So that's a possibility for us. We've also talked about um, just trying to get into a conference in the fall if if anybody's offering one and if we can travel we don't know that either yet that's a big hit carrie do you want to talk about um the heartland conference a little bit oh sure hi so our mcnair um the mokini heartland conference is in kansas city every fall at the and near the end of september we just had meetings and we had one yesterday. We don't know if we're gonna be able to go live or if we're gonna do virtual, but we've decided to do, I think we've decided to do something simply for the fact that our students do need the presentation experiences and this is one way we can provide it. Um, but we just don't really know what it's gonna look like yet. You said it's called the Heartland mm -hmm. Conference? Okay. Heartland, mm-hmm. Well, guys, thank you for, for sharing. Um, I see someone's son. Hi, hi, Jeremy's son. <laughs> Hello. I, I, I like being in these conferences, um, these, um, these um, video conferencing and, and seeing kids. It always is a highlight to my day. So um, thank you guys for, for sharing. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to, hi, uh, Dr. Stewart. I see you joined us. Welcome. <laughs> Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dante uh, McFadden now, who's going to um, cover some other topics. Thank you very much. And um, before I begin to the next topic, um, I just want to say, I think um, I recall seeing that uh, Purdue University Northwest, they were having an uh, undergraduate research conference in November uh, that was open to McNair scholars. I do not know what the status of that is at this point, um, but that's the only one that I'm aware of. Um, at least in November. 
But um, I just want to spend some uh, time uh, covering a few other topics uh, for our conversation. Uh, one topic involves mental health and wellness of staff and students. Uh, with regards to uh, the staff, um, I'm slowly forming that. And I think, um, you know, once uh, we begin having um, conversations on a regular basis, we can then uh, determine, uh, you know, what's the, um, you know, what's the healthiest way for us to correspond with one another, whether we're just talking about the program itself or if it's just bonding activities um, as a staff, um, you know, whether that's, um, you know, checking in, um, you know, some type of informative video together um, via YouTube, you know, doing some type or, you know, finding some way to um, find some way to, um, you know, just um, I don't want to say socialize, but, you know, just correspond with one another in a way that can also serve, uh, fulfill professional development um, opportunities as well. So, um, like I said, um, you know, I had, I just, I, now I have everyone hired and so it's just a matter of us meeting and, you know, just determining uh, the dynamic that's not just going to best serve the students, but also serve how we operate um, virtually. With regards to the students, um, at least, um, you know, with the university, when everything um, shifted to a virtual format, uh, one of the first um, emails that went out to students was that the counseling center um, is available uh, for students who are having a tough time making these adjustments uh, to um, particularly for um, seniors um, who are going to be graduating and, uh, you know, can't have, uh, you know, their May commencement in person with people. Um, at least in Marquette's case, um, the commencement's going to be at the end of August, but, um, you know, just students dealing with that, students who, um, ha you know, just have to go back to living with uh, their families, and, you know, just kind of going back into this mentality that they're like high school students again. And even though they have a lot of work that they have to fulfill, um, you know, if their parents sees them there, that means they're available to do chores or whatever. So, um, and we were talking earlier about, um, you know, providing students allowances to um, live co closer to campus. Um, I think that's really key. And I think that's also um, really important for what, um, you know, depending on your states and, you know, what, how they do this rolling reentry, you know, from this current uh, stay at home order or, you know, whatever your states are under right now. I think that's going to um, be a strong determinant um, in terms of, you know, what kind of things students can do in person. Granted, if they do it in person, you have to execute it in a way that um, there's a significant physical distancing, um, you know, just so that um, you don't uh, run the risk of getting anyone sick. Um, in terms of online resources, um, this is something that I'm still exploring, um, you know, for students who, um, you know, may take part in um, yoga practice or meditation practices. I'm just trying to find out what's available or, you know, students who get, um, are doing step aerobics, um, given that they are in a living space where they have the capacity to, to do that. Um, that's something that I'm trying to explore as well. Um, but... Um, whatever the students engage themselves with, um, I really want to just be in a position to present ideas to them and let them determine among themselves um, what they want to take part in and how they want to take part in it. Um, because, um, you know, you already have them uh, doing this intensive research over the summer, um, you know, within um, this capacity and, you know, just to, you know, force them to do another thing on top of that. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, may undermine, you know, whatever um, well-meaning intentions you may have. I'm curious to know what are some other things um, that people are considering with regards to the mental health and wellness of their staff and their students? So Dante at uh, Bowling Green, um, we have, um, because we have our trio programs in a department, mm -hmm. we have students that are hired off of our various grants who work with us doing like handling our social media and handling like some of our marketing pieces. And so the staff came up with different types of ways and then we have mentors and so some of our scholars happen to be SSS participants as well so we've kind of 
kind of mixed it up a little bit. Um, and we have like one of our students was doing this exercise thing. And so it was like a, um, a exercise hour on Wednesdays from 11 to noon. And so students could join in and we had tea time on Fridays with one of our students. We had a staff person who was doing, um, her name is Beck and it was called On Deck with Beck. And she was doing like self care and email etiquette and kind of, so students, and then we were pumping this through social media. So students would get a text message with a link and we use WebEx at our campus. So that's kind of how we have tried to engage our students. Um, and then at times when we're in meetings with students, like just coming to terms with the reality that some students are experiencing death and, 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 and being mindful of that. And so I participate on in meetings on our campus with our um, provost and we're talking about how we're engaging students. And so just reminding and being helping folks to be mindful of the fact that as we think about asynchronous or we think about assignments and modifications, realizing that these students may be experiencing death or maybe even have had COVID themselves. And so um, I've been shocked sometimes by um, a student saying, me and my family just went through COVID. We, some of our students, we're in, we're in Ohio, and so Michigan is like really close to us. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had a couple students who, you know, openly talked about the fact that they had COVID. And, and you know, so we just kind of talked through that and like, what was that experience like and um, ways of staying healthy. And so, of course, you know, we don't talk about that in open settings unless they bring it up. But this is a reality. I had another student who was kind of almost fell apart on me in the middle of a, of a session um, because both of her, her grandparents passed away. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, this is reality. This is the reality of this, of, of some of the things that our students are facing. And so as they come into these spaces, you know, you're right, being mindful of that, but also not forgetting that the stuff that we're seeing, although we don't talk about it, it may be closer to us than what we think in terms of like the impact. Mm -hmm. So just creating spaces where they can just come in and just kind of. Right. You, you know, there, there's, been, there's been an interesting thing with ours because we've had our workshops and we've been starting it with just like truly checking in with people, having them start the Zoom meetings earlier and truly checking in more than just like, hey, how are you doing? Um, I found some article that kind of went into real true questions to ask in this pandemic. That's not just how you do it and that everybody has a general one. Um, and I've used some of those prompts. And it's been interesting. Uh, we had one student who wasn't able to attend, so I recorded it. Um, and she was just saying how much that felt and that helped her because so many of our faculty, as they were adjusting, especially in the early days of this, were trying to get back on track, trying to get all the stuff and were able to get just the business. Uh, and so it's something that McNair's in an interesting place that we can kind of diverge from the business because yep. our business is also making sure they're in a good mental they're able to create uh, good mental practices for graduate school. For sure. um, our workshop yesterday was literally just talking about mental practices and how, how the, the stresses of graduate school, even outside of a pandemic are and what this adds to. And it really became a good conversation between students. They're able to see that they're all on the same page, even though they're all these different majors. I know I'm preaching to the choir on that. Um, it, no, it's, this is, that's good. This is good stuff. Okay. Um, it, it's, a good set a good place that you can just kind of get them first used to talking and used to breaking down when well, I wouldn't say breaking down but being open on zoom and even though it feels like you're back and forth on there I think it's really helped students to become more open with themselves um, and kind of be able to realize okay we can talk about it here I can be able to kind of create this own community I have within McNair at whatever institution I'm going to be going on to um, mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to see what happens with students on there. Um, it's one of the things that makes me a little frustrated right now because we're not able to do that in person uh, yeah. because it's been the culmination of it. Um, and, and it's also, Dante, you were saying so many things that I th still think you weren't even going in as, um, yes, I'll send that out, Shanna. I've got to find it though. Um, it's on my Facebook page somewhere. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, not even going into it. I had one student that we're doing, that, we're, that we've been talking with that uh, literally had to email us and say, I can't come to this meeting because I'm not in a safe place. Um, and that's a scary, scary thought. I've had other students even before this pandemic who told me he, he put a shotgun in his mouth and was about to commit suicide and didn't. Um, he's in a better place now, but you know, those are some of the ones that I know about. Um, and it worries me because I know there are other ones I don't. Um, and so doing anything that we can just be able to, to, to present the community, present the safe place, I think really adds to that. Um, right. And um, 
you know, Jeremy, I think you make an excellent point in terms of, you know, just um, using this as a moment uh, to teach students how to seek resources out when they uh, transition into graduate programs. And um, um, for you, um, Jeremy, and for Vicky, and to everyone who's in on this conversation, um, you know, particularly with students who are dealing with COVID-19, what are they getting sick themselves? What are they dealing with? Um, what are they dealing with family members who have gotten sick or who, have, who are now deceased? Or, you know, dealing with um, anxiety and uh, uh, depression in response to uh, what's been going on? Um, you know, have any, has any, have any of you um, started any support groups um, for students um, in different capacities, whether they um, have been infected or may, they may have lost family members? We haven't. Um, just as, as the conversation ensues, I just kind of, you know, really just talk with the student, like the one student, she was just telling me like we, she had, they, her family had it, I think right when we went on spring break and we had just made, our president made the decision that we were going remote um, for a period of time and um, we were meeting in person. So I was just kind of like, whoa, <laughs> like, wow, that, that was that close to it. And other students were that close to this being a reality, right? Um, but I, I just had a conversation with her about kind of what suggestions did she have? Like, how did she survive COVID? Like, just just let her talk about it. And she she just went into talking about how she thinks she got it. You know, and we talked about um, strategies that she used to help herself stay um, healthy, like breathing. And she didn't take anything for her fever because of the heat that this, this virus is supposed to be sensitive to. And so I just let her kind of talk through that. Um, sometimes um, I've had a student who's looking at um, one of her, part of her research, what she's focusing is, um, 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 anxiety around death in youth. Yeah. And so um, I, we were talking about her intro to her research, right? And so we just talked about COVID a little bit and like how this might be a good emphasis to um, her like setting that introduction. Like this is creating anxiety, not just for, for like those people, who, like everybody in society, but thinking about that with youth, that can be, she can probably maybe talk about that in, in her introduction, setting the stage for why she wants to conduct that study, right, um, as part of her introduction. And so I just try to have conversations with students where, where they're at. If they bring it up, we talk about it. If they talk about anxiety just in general about online, we talk about that. We talk about, you know, and so in our, in our um, I told you in our, we have class two days a week, the one day where we were doing the um, the, the um, words, we were doing the um, GRE words, right? We cut that off. Sometimes we may have just conversations about just kind of maintaining health um, and where we've been able to, to talk about avenues for students to be able to, to, to get um, employment where they're not going out of their homes to stay kind of, you know, safe and, and at home so they can think about leading up to the research. So if we've had opportunities in some of our other TRIO programs to hire them as mentors, looking at our career center and bringing them into the conversation. So it's, it's kind of been more centered around that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of like a one-on-one, -on -one. but if a student is in distress, it's like, okay, here's the counseling center as well. They have a lot more open hours because their traffic slowed down. So for, from Bowling Green's perspective, it's just been kind of like that kind of situation. Um, we have a raised hand. Namika, did you want to say something? Hi, everyone. Um, I actually have another call at two, so I wanted to uh, <laughs> okay. offer a, a contribution before I rolled up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the main thing I just wanted to share is that um, at Illinois, we do um, have um, two different cohorts. We have an academic school year cohort. Um, our seniors who are graduating, and we have um, our what we call new and continuing scholars. Um, new and continuing scholars during the school year are basically prepping to do the summer, and our graduating scholars are finishing up their project um, their senior year in preparation for an on-campus annual research conference that they are they participate in before they graduate. When all of this started. Uh, we were coming off of spring break, as most of you were, 
Um, and I feel blessed that I was basically given permission to focus on our scholars' mental health. Um, we, we, we basically pushed everything to the summer. Um, we basically told our students to not worry about their research right now and to figure out how to transition life um, into um, back into this new life. Uh, we ultimately have our graduate assistant has been checking on them regularly and um, I will uh, begin checking on them next week. I actually have been intentional about not um, checking in on them. And the reason is because I bring stress to them. <laughs> when I'm around, <laughs> you know, they see, and I'm okay with that. You know, we have our roles in the office and I'm the one that has, you know, they have to do stuff for. And so I've been intentional about making sure that they're interacting with um, the graduate assistant because that's the person they have that kind of more relaxed relationship with. And then, um, and so now it's that time for us to start talking about the summer and what we're gonna do. And so I've given them a break. <laughs> so I don't feel bad that I'm about to stress them out now. <laughs> um, and so that's what um, all the on-campus uh, presentations were uh, either canceled or went virtual anyway. We did not put pressure on our scholars to do that. Um, we actually already have a model of stretching out research for an entire, for uh, a two year period, right? So the first year that they come into the program is juniors. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't like being on these calls with no video, but I'm not video capable today. I'm so sorry, but- um, No worries. <laughs> so we, um, we, the first year, we bring them in as juniors um, and we, um, we basically spend that year teaching them how to do research. In the summer, they are expected to mainly focus on knowing how to write a good literature review. So, um, the, and by the end of the summer, they only need to come have a research proposal. So the, what many of you all are, are transitioning to, we've already been doing. Um, and so, um, so that's been, that isn't really a major transition for us. The, ba the bigger transition was our graduating seniors. They usually complete and submit their final project at this time. What we've decided to do is take advantage of something that we haven't been able to do and we've wanted to do for so many years is to take that work that they've done and make it publishable. So what we've decided to do is we are taking this time with our graduating seniors to work on their current project that they worked that they had already started working on and perfecting it into a publishable document. So, um, so we will, uh, which of course uh, we have extended. Uh, anyone who knows that publications are, you know, is not something you can do overnight. And so even, and so we are. Uh, we feel very blessed that we have scholars, our graduating scholars who want to do this. And so they've all made commitments to continue working with the program um, to, to work on this journal that we hope to be kind of the shining light of this awful situation. So, so um, I'm glad that I was able to join. Does anyone have questions before I jump off? And I, um, I did, as I wrote in the, the plan, I actually wrote up a completely um, new um, learning plan for our students. Um, they have a complete, um, it's a, at this point, it's about 25 pages, might be too long for them, but <laughs> we'll go through it together. Um, but it really is a complete revamp. Uh, basically, we, I, we just took everything in, the, in our regular handbook and made it virtual. <laughs> That's basically what we did. Um, and so hopefully now they, they will have a, a, a much better guide. And we had, and again, we haven't even given them that yet because once, anytime, you know, you all know, when we give them anything McNair, it puts them in a complete freak out mode. And we have been mostly concerned about, um, you know, them just getting, getting, getting finished um, with the semester, considering everything that they have to do. So thanks for your time, guys. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Namika. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. And um, I know some of you um, have to leave at two for those of you sticking around. Um, thank you very much. For also. So just a couple more topics I'd like to uh, talk with the group about. Um, and Tina, were you wanting to speak to this topic? Um, just regarding the wellness, we've always had three different ways the students could report on how they're doing 
during the summer. And so we have our weekly McNair check-in meetings, which I think for all the virtual meetings, we're going to aim to try to keep them under an hour. But um, they can then as a group share with uh, each other how things are going well or how they're struggling. But some aren't necessarily comfortable bringing it up to the whole group. So they can either bring it up in their one-on-one -on -one session with whoever is serving as their advisor during the summer. We have a STEM advisor and a um, social sciences humanities advisor who's the assistant director Cruz who's on line. But um, the other thing is that we have a weekly report where they write their progress, pros and cons, what's going well and what's not going well. So that if they're not able to verbalize it necessarily in either of those settings, then, then we're at least um, maybe hearing about it through that written report. So it's just a suggestion. Yeah, we have something similar to that uh, for our summer as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. We have one other hand up. Risa, are you wanting to uh, hop onto this topic? Yes, just okay. very briefly, I was yeah. going to share a link um, in the chat, but to tell you what it is, um, I found it a while ago. I haven't done anything with it just yet, but I liked the prompts that were in it. They were journal prompts for mental health. They were therapeutic prompts. Um, so some of them, I don't know that I would feel like the capacity to wade into that water and unpack it with them, but some of them, you know, talking about coping mechanisms, which ones work best for you. There are certain ones that were positive. I did not highlight there's bold in there. I, that's not my bold. That's them. Um, but there, but I, I, I liked what was there and trying to figure out what's another way to kind of get at some of these topics, maybe in a journal, like if we encourage them to do some writing. Um, and then also just to kind of comment, the question initially was talking about like students and staff. And so I wanted to just bring up like what we're recently starting to experience on ours uh, in our SSS program is that um, one of the staff members, like the aunt, the uncle, the cousin, the mom, the dad, the brother, they've all been positive. Many of them are in the hospitals and on ventilators and staff also like, so what happens then when they're not able to, you know, how do you work with them and with HR and, and what kind of leave policy, how do you communicate with them um, to just also remember that it, it's been, it's our side too. So, uh, and how we support each other with that. That was all. Right. And uh, Risa, Vicky, um, you both mentioned, um, you know, some, uh, you know, some McNair students overlapping with um, SSS. Um, you know, Vicky, like uh, your program, um, we're all, you know, like I said, all of our TRIO programs are in one department. And I'll have to talk with the, um, the SSS program. They're in the midst of the, uh, planning out their summer for their freshmen. And I'll look into seeing, um, you know, if they're utilizing anyone uh, for any type of uh, wellness practices and um, just seeing, um, you know, what um, they can do for our scholars. So um, any, any other hands, any other comments before I move on? Um, I just wanted to, where I see the biggest mental health challenges, and, and I don't know if, if I'm alone in this, is actually my graduating students. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I've, had, I've had two that I know of in the last week have expressed to me in writing or in meetings, they don't think they're going on because they don't know what it looks like. And I'm, I'm encouraging, keep all your options open or they feel like they have to get a job. Jobs are not plentiful right now either. And it's not gonna be a job that you want long-term. And so they're not saying they're never going, but they're saying, I, I'm not going now. I'm gonna wait till January, I'm gonna wait a year. And I, I think it's starting to hit them really hard. And I, I have several who are in a bad place as far as their graduate school plan. It's, it's hard to make a whole life transition to a new location. And you know, when you don't even know what's happening in your life right now, day to day. And I, I'm seeing that really as probably um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges is, is my graduating students right now. And you know, and yet I'm afraid after they graduate, they're gonna be like, oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with everything there. I'm done with, with um, school. I'm done with everything. And, and they're gonna disengage completely. And I'm, and I'm kind of worried about, about them and you know, over the next three to four to five months and, and the decisions that they're gonna be making. Right, because you know, later, um, you know, towards the end of the year, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's some concern that will revert right back to where we are right now again. 
And then a word know, about the economics. Sorry, Dante, but I've been telling the students that the fellowships they're being offered might not be available if they wait a year, but it's really up to them. That's and what I was going to say, yeah. But the economy is not going to get better soon, and it actually might be more challenging to go a year from now. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, we've been um, take, um, having our students to engage with our career center and we've been creating opportunities for them to have discussions like I know some of our students who were thinking about going to other places have made a decision to stay at our institution. So I find myself anymore because they're comfortable. So like not having to think about moving somewhere else. Um, they're now applying in the institution, you know, I'm sure they're excited about that because those are more students that are staying at BG um, instead of thinking about where are we, how are we going to keep our numbers up for students who are coming into the institution, right? Students who are in McNair are making a decision to stay. I have at least two students just in this past week that I've had to either submit a um, waiver for, for our institution or write a recommendation letter for. So if there, those fears arise, um, you know, maybe that might be some conversation have they considered local or even back home um, because if they're going to be moving back home and they're afraid to move you know across the country um, perhaps maybe it's time to have that conversation with them right so um if there's nothing further um next topic i want to talk about is uh student recruitment and hiring uh, within this situation that we're in right now. Uh, with regards to hiring, um, I think, um, you know, we've still been able to, um, you know, at least from my institution, we've been able to maintain some continuity. Um, when I was hiring for a program coordinator, we were doing, um, you know, we were all still meeting in person when we were doing the phone interviews. And then uh, when the university demanded that we all work remotely, um, I had to think of some ways to facilitate um, like a virtual campus uh, visit uh, for each uh, job, for each uh, finalist, uh, you know, just um, using Zoom and using Microsoft Teams uh, just to schedule meetings and, you know, you know, schedule uh, meetings uh, with myself, uh, with the executive director of EOP, uh, with EOP staff, give a um, presentation on um, how they would approach this position, and then also meeting with students, meeting with uh, faculty mentors, meeting with uh, campus stakeholders, so on and so forth. Um, and it all went, um, it all went quite smoothly um, with regards to, um, you know, just how it would if we were doing it in person. And I think each of the finalists, um, you know, how they presented themselves when we did like phone, initial phone interviews uh, was pretty consistent with how they presented themselves when they did these kind of interviews within this format. And um, I'm very happy with um, the choice that I made. Um, thankfully, the person that I offered it to accepted it, uh, the position. And, and thankfully, I'm also in a situation where the people who I worked with last summer are coming back this summer. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, just, um, you know, redrafting re, uh, the contracts and um, getting everything um, all set to go. With regards to student recruitment, um, you know, if we revert back to this uh, format, um, in our program, uh, we do a lot of our recruitment in the fall. I know some McNair uh, programs do their recruitment during the spring. Um, so the main basis for our recruitment is, you um, just um, circulating emails uh, to a database of eligible students, as well as um, circulating information to um, department chairs, um, deans of various schools and colleges, and then, um, you know, just other campus stakeholders, uh, you know, just help uh, you know, circulate the word. Um, and I think, um, you know, virtually, um, you know, it's just a matter of, um, you know, thinking of, um, you know what you know rather than post um you know posters um across campus you'll um you know you can just uh, do that uh, via email or other electronic formats as well um and then with um you know having orientation sessions or, or i should say information sessions um you know just thinking about um scheduling a time and um, just seeing uh, what interested students uh, are willing to join in on the meeting and also just thinking about, um, you know, how would you schedule 
um, interviews with potential students, um, you know, who are applying for the program. Um, so for me, it's, um, you know, it's um, not too um, challenging to make that shift. Um, it's just a matter of thinking about, okay, so, you know, if I'm not going to be able to do this in person, um, you know, how can, you know, I can, you know, how can I convey this information electronically? And, you know, thankfully, you know, you can, co you can communicate to a student via email and you can also call them over the phone as well if they have to uh, take any uh, questions. Uh, with regards to um, hiring and um, recruiting students for your programs, uh, what are some other things that are going through your mind or what are some things that you've experienced? Um, you know, we've got a whole, we've, we've shifted kind of our philosophy of how we recruit. I apologize, my wife's right next door um, on an academic advisor call, so if she's kind of interferes. Um, we've shifted it more to like a pipeline where we have, where we start recruiting and targeting our freshmen and sophomore students of just getting involved with our, what we call Discover program, which is basically a free McNair program. And so one idea you might have is to develop programming of that, of things that it's an opportunity to get these high achieving, potentially high achieving um, freshmen and sophomores who aren't given the opportunity right away to have leadership positions. And so you're able to get them and they maybe have that their senior year in high school. You're able to get that in terms of saying, hey, we need ambassadors. We need people to help us do this program. And the program can, is literally starts to become talking about giving them the professional development they need. Um, talking about what are the opportunities that you have in graduate school. So talking about how to go talk to a faculty member beyond just talking about the class, how to get the topic going of the research, get the topic going of why did that faculty member go into graduate school? What are the other possible different paths on there? It's shifted our whole type of recruitment of students. Um, it's one that we've started to get some of the fruits from. Um, in terms of what it's really designed to do is to give us a stronger quality candidate by the time they actually start to apply. Right. Um, it, it's been some of it in our, our recruitment stuff is still open of everything else that you said, Dante, that we still will like try to do everything else we can to get students that we miss those early on years. But mm -hmm. it's one of those things that right at the beginning of the fall semester, we start to target the freshmen and sophomores. Um, and send them an email that it looks like, hey, because of your grades, because of this, you've been selected for it. And it's true. There's a GPA of a 2.8 minimum, and there's some other things that we're basing it on. Um, but it really makes the students feel, okay, this can be a really big thing. Um, it's one that we see a lot of churn come from it. You know, we've had at one point a lots of hundreds of people in it. I wouldn't say hundreds. I think at one point we had like 125 in it. And by the next time we went to 50, next meeting went to 50, next it was 20. And then by the end, they're like 15 that were really strong candidates that were really going in our pipeline, but they're getting stuff out of it. Um, and we gave them some actual programming that we opened up from our McNair stuff that was good and broad. What were some of the early things you wish you knew your undergraduate career so that you could start to funnel in the direction on that? Um, that's something that's really been big for us. It's something that um, we mainly, uh, one of my graduate students does for us um, with with my some of my direction on there too. Uh, that's one of the been one of the biggest things too, and it helps shift the recruitment because I would still say we heavily recruit more in the spring for students, but this shifts a lot of that into the fall, and students are being recruited for it whether or not they realize it. Thank you. Others. a question um i'm worried that i'm not going to make my numbers and um on one of the co conference calls with coe they they suggested that we wait um to send a letter kind of amending your numbers or any kind of major shift you know how you have to send that letter to your program officer saying i'm changing this or i'm changing that substantially and I just kind of wanted to get you guys this feedback on kind of if you were in my situation what would you do yeah and that's um yeah that's a real uh, situation to think about because some students may end up having to transfer uh to a campus um that's either closer to home or you know that's more affordable of things that I've done um, is after we went virtual because I reached out to 
um, a couple people who had been in the in the um, application process and had not finished it, or a couple of them they had been accepted and um, then decided it was not for them. And so I sent a, an email that basically said, "I know where you stood before, but that was that was." pre-COVID world and now we're living in COVID world and here are things that we can do, that McNair can do to support you. And so, you know, the McNair experience in itself is gonna look different than what we talked about when you were applying the first time. So here's what we can do for you. If this is something you're interested in, let me know and we can reconsider um, whether, you know, whether McNair is, is a good fit for you at this time. Um, because I had had one student who, because of some things, didn't, her, her application, by the time we got her application in, um, and all completed, she had taken on some other leadership steps and she just didn't know if she would have time. Well, some of those things have dried up because we're no longer on campus, you're at home all the time. So now she felt like she has time. And then I had another student who had, um, huh, who had been accepted and had been encouraged by her department that they didn't know that she would have time for McNair. Um, but I reached out to her and so she, she had left McNair because she was feeling pressure from her department. And I reached out to her again and I said, you know, I don't know how they feel right now, um, but here are the supports that we can offer you. And I do not want it to be an additional stressor. That's never the point, the point of McNair. It is a commitment and it takes time. And you know, that scares a lot of students. And so the commitment part, if you're not really in it, is, is, is a struggle for some. But at the same time, the support that we can offer right now um, was, was appealing. And so I've had two students who have said, yeah, it was not a good fit before but it is now and I need the help. And, and, I, and I had, an, I had a, two more that, that never replied and that's fine too. Um, but so two students who, um, it, it was not feasible for them initially, but they were quality candidates and, and now they're in and they're participating and um, you know, we'll kind of go from there. And, and we don't know what it looks like when we come back in the fall and, um, or if we get to go back in the fall or whenever we get to go back, um, you know, what their commitment level will be able to be maintained, but hopefully they've made a connection and we've provided services to them. And um, is it the full, true, you know, because they're not with the cohort that they would have been with, but we can still provide services to them. So that's one approach that I took. Mm -hmm. Gina, I think that's a really smart approach um, because you make it more so about what the program can offer um, in a long-term sense as opposed to just um, you know, trying to talk them into staying, sticking with the program because you need to fulfill your numbers. So you know, just making it more centered on you know, what they can benefit from in the long, in the long run as opposed to um, you know, just like a quick fix situation I think is um, very effective. Hi, Retta. Um, so we were concerned this year for recruitment. We recruit right now in the spring and we're graduating quite a large senior class. So we have 15 spots to fill this year, which is pretty atypical. Um, so being in these situations where students are getting swamped with emails because that's the only way the institution is communicating right now, um, we had to figure out ways to sort of work around that. So something, two things that were really successful for us, we're at a small institution but uh, so that may differ for you, but we outreach to faculty to ask them who they feel would be strong candidates. Mm -hmm. And so we do the legwork in terms of finding out who's eligible for our program. Um, so that way we can give them a little better idea um, of who, who we're trying to recruit. And we got 39 faculty recommendations. So that's 39 students that I can now reach out to that they can encourage to apply. Um, and I also use my current scholars. So a lot of my scholars are involved in leadership positions on campus still. And so I said, hey guys, can you reach out to your organizations? You know, here's some of the names of the students we're trying to recruit, can you talk to them? And the nice part is they don't have to email them. They can text them, they can instant message them, Facebook Messenger, uh, 
lots of other venues there, but I found those two things to be super successful right now. We have 32 applicants sitting uh, that have completed their application. So, um, yeah. Others, um, whether it's in res direct response to a uh, registered question or, um, you know, just in general about hiring and student recruitment. I think it's also um, rather to your, um, with regards to your question, um, I don't have a direct answer for you, but I think it's worth, um, have you um, raised this question in any of the COE rep webinars or other McNair centric webinars? So I sent, um, uh, for the math one, I, I sent, I sent in the question, but um, the general response has been to wait. And so that, it makes sense to me, wait until the end of this year before you change your numbers, because you could be moving prematurely and then you have to send another letter saying, I'll, I'll keep what I have. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, that that's kind of where I'm going. Well, I guess what I'm wrapping my head around is kind of, accepting that I might lose my um, prior experience points for this year because mm -hmm. the DOE hasn't come out with any kind of accommodation um, with COVID-19, anything that any kind of relax, relaxing of the rules for this. Mm -hmm. So kind of just wrapping my head around that in preparation for rewriting. So I kind of have my answer, but I just kind of wanted to see what other people were thinking. Yeah. And you know, waiting for the Department of Ed to, you know, come up with, you know, some type of language regarding COVID-19. The people that we work with are waiting for that as well. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we have um, about a little over five minutes left. So the last topic I want to talk about is um, sharing resources. And the capacity in which I can talk about it is, um, you know, just some recent conversations that I've had with my colleagues at UW-Milwaukee uh, UW Whitewater, and then also Beloit College. And we've been talking about, you know, ways in which, um, you know, we can share resources this summer with regards to, um, you know, just some um, virtual graduate school visits, uh, reaching out to various people uh, just to talk about um, giving a presentation and then also um, finding out, you know, what's the, what are the best strategies to encourage students to uh, reach out to faculty um, to have a conversation uh, via over the phone or you know via a zoom meeting or Microsoft teams meeting um, and still you know even though you know they won't be there in person obviously but you know still get the same kind of information that they would get um, you know just to learn about what the program offers um, if it's a good fit and um, so on and so forth we're also talking about that with regards to uh, GRE uh, preparation um, so, you know, just thinking about, you know, what's some um, instructor, um, first of all, which program would host an instructor and, um, you know, how would we um, pull um, our resources together to uh, pay that person? And then also just uh, finding resources outside of our grant to um, um, find um, GRE supply so that we can create the best experience possible for students to prepare for uh, the GRE. Uh, so those are some of the conversations that um, I've been taking part in. Um, you know, what other conversations have you been having with um, your colleagues in McNair? Um, Jeremy. Dante, can we tell you what Mo e has been up to lately? Um, so yeah, you can see Shannon smiling like, yeah, I was going to bring it up. Uh, so we're all going to be collaborating this summer to be able to do a GRE session for all of our students. Um, where it's kind of, it's really been exciting. We've been hashing it out through a couple different meetings uh, where we all have some, one of our experts, one of our instructors uh, to be able to do each one of the different pieces of the GRE. So it's really going to be a great opportunity to kind of, to me, it's going to be different people that aren't in our own silos. Um, this is how I'm approaching it. Um, and to be able to get some different views and different approaches to each of the different things. Uh, we're able to use, at least from Missouri, um, as another supplemental one for the GRE because, frankly, we have money we need to spend, um, which is like a weird thing. And I, you, at least y'all are in the same situation, I'm sure. <laughs> you can't say that anywhere else across campus. Um, so we're able to, we were just breaking it down that we're going to have like five different instructors, one from each of some of our different institutions. And then what's nice too, we're kind of dodging some of the normal rules because Shanna brought up that we'd be able to possibly have um, them come as an honorarium. Oh, I froze. I hate that. Did I freeze? No, I did it. I froze. I'm back. Okay. You're good. You're good. Okay. 
Sorry, I, was, I saw everybody freeze. I'm like, no, I froze. <laughs> now my wife's laughing at me. But you were um, talking about uh, paying an uh, honorarium? Yeah, but then to be able to hire them through Mo Can Need, which is our mm-hmm. state chapter, um, to be able to do that, and then each of our un- each of our programs be able to pay Mo Can Need for that. So therefore, we don't have to like deal with all the rigmarole because our campus is on a hiring freeze, as I'm sure a lot of other places are too. Um, so it's kind of a great way to be able to get it. And I think our instructors will probably be a little bit more open for some of that aspect as well. Um, so that's some things we're doing. And I can see a lot more doing that at your own state level or join in on a couple different states on there too. Right, right. So it's good to know we're on the same page. Um, what are other people thinking in terms of resource sharing? One of the things that Sam and I were talking about um, that's on the call too, uh, just last week, she brought up, you know, with the loss of the, like they went to, we went to Kent State last year um, and that connection, that scholar to scholar connection. um, And so not really necessarily waiting like all the eggs in the basket of the UCLA event and then maybe waiting on a fall, but just to try to partner up with other McNair programs and, and do like presentation sharing or you know, practice presentations, whether we formalize it to the level that Mo Canny is doing, like with the Illinois board, like on our side, we could certainly talk that way, but did it just make some sense to try to just partner up with a couple different programs at different times or facilitate that process in any way to connect with you all and just have different days in the summer where we can watch their presentations, they can watch ours or to try to build that community across programs. Thank you. Others. We're well, still, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. No, we're still trying to figure it out. It's really complicated with the Zoom uh, virtual format. So what we're thinking is that it might have to be lecture style um, and where the students would just listen and then we would have breakout rooms in the Zoom so they could work on the problems together. But. You know, a part of it is we're trying to figure out just the scheduling alone. We right. usually just have our programming primarily between 8.30 and 5. And our students are having much more chaotic schedules now that they're in their homes with a lot of younger siblings or yeah. um, other responsibilities. So. Yeah. And you got family members competing to use the computer. Mm-hmm. That and also like we've been, we did a survey to ask them what time of the, what time is the house the craziest, recognizing that it's not going to be useful if they can't produce during certain hours. So they, we were surprised they said four to six, but that kind of makes sense. If anybody is working, they probably still are, are working a normal business day and are coming home for dinner around that time. And if there's younger kids, they probably have to help with providing dinner, but we're trying, it's, it's been a little bit of a struggle between the instructors and the students trying to figure out the schedule. Right. Others. So it looks like we're about at the uh, end of our time. Um, so um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, correspond with each other through uh, one of the COE webinars or if EOA decides to sponsor one again, or, you know, there's also, um, you know, there's also um, the National McNair Listserv in which uh, we could pull resources. So. All right, thank you all uh, for being here. Um, it's good to see that you all are safe and well where you are. And um, you know, I hope that's the same uh, for your students as well. And um, I hope you uh, have a chance to enjoy your weekend. Um, thankfully in Milwaukee, the sun's out, so I'll try to enjoy some sunshine. So uh, thank you all for taking part in this. Um, and take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good one. Stay safe, y'all. You too. Thank you.